is a webinar to engage the community of safeguarding professionals in a discussion on the next version of the practice guidance from the national panel. Uh, and they're particularly asking for your feedback on the variety of learning reviews and examples of good practice uh, in order to influence that practice guidance uh, version that's uh, due out shortly. And uh, we welcome all input today, whether that's by coming off mute and speaking um, or indeed capturing it into the uh, forum. And um, I'm delighted to have uh, Amina alongside me today, who is going to be uh, looking at the Zoom chat. So if there's anybody who has any problems uh, joining or rejoining or getting to the forum, uh, then please just message her in Zoom. Uh, and if you're not yet able to join the forum, you will find that link in the Zoom chat. You'll also find it on the invitation uh, where we asked you to uh, contribute to the pre-work. So I'm going to introduce uh, Karen Manners, uh, the uh, interim chair of the panel. And uh, I think, Karen, just uh, a couple of um, points about the pre-work and uh, how that's going to be included in the discussion today. Uh, and also uh, just a, a little about the purpose for the webinar today. So over to you, Karen. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's um, my pleasure on behalf of the National Child Safeguarding Practice Review Panel, hence to be known as the panel, uh, to welcome you to our very first webinar. Um, you're going to have a, real, a really good opportunity to speak to several members of the panel throughout this webinar who are all online and obviously various people doing presentations. So do take that opportunity. Part of our remit is to engage as much as we can with the safeguarding partners to ensure that the work we undertake um, uh, dovetails into what you're doing out there um, um, on the front line, as it were. But many, uh, you know, a, a real welcome to this, and I hope that uh, the interaction works well. Please, you know, do give us your questions. We've already seen some really good ones coming through, and the more interaction we have, the more wealth of, um, um, you know, information we'll have to put in the guidance as we move forward. It, you know, it needs to be a two-way flow and us working together, which is um, our mantra in the uh, multi-agency arena, isn't it? Okay. Um, hopefully most people now know who the panel members are. If I very quickly, from left of screen to right, just introduce them. Isabel Trowler, who is obviously the social worker for England. P Professor uh, Peter Sidebotham, background in health. And I'm not doing them any justice, but you can look up their CVs. Um, and then Dale, who is with a background in um, uh, law, myself. And my background is in policing. And, um, but as I am currently the interim chair as well, um, that is out for adverts. So if you wish to apply, you have an opportunity. Um, and then Mark Gurry, who's presenting today, background in child social care. Uh, Sarah Elliott, background in health. And uh, last but not least, Dr. Susan Tranter, education, obviously another very important partner. That is the panel. Uh, we're not full time. Um, you know, we work a few days a month um, doing quite significant work and obviously including all of the national reviews that we undertake. Um, today, as, as Steve has introduced, is about sharing insights and a collaborative discussion so we can work together to identify improvements to practice. Our whole focus is obviously through the lens of looking at incidents of serious harm and death, which we know is a narrow lens, but actually through that, how do we identify good practice that is happening out there for which there is lots, but also how we actually improve practice and do that in as prompt and efficient way as possible through the nature of the different reviews that we're going to talk about today. Okay, moving on. Just a really big um, um, peripheral oversight on COVID. It's very early days for us for, as a panel to look at what the consequences of the work that's um, um, occurring and also the impact on children. But I can give you some insights that we're currently seeing. First of all, the, th the thing we want to do is recognize the outstanding work that partners have been doing through what is a unique set of circumstances. And we're already identifying and asking for some um, best practice around how people have engaged, um, um, you know, through what, you know, is just, you know, um, uh, amazing um, methods that have made sure that children are kept as safe as possible. 
Ultimately, though, in terms of the figures, what we're seeing is that um, as we went into lockdown in March and April, there was no discernible change in the overall number of notifications that the panel were receiving. Um, May and June have then seen slight increases in that overall number, but actually um, too early to say whether or not that's statistically significant and more importantly, actually, whether or not we're going to see a pattern continuing as we move forward. But those are reviewed every two weeks when the panel meet and obviously we're keeping a very close eye. Early on in the lockdown, we asked partners to start identifying through their rapid reviews where they see an impact that COVID is having. And as time has moved on, we're seeing more and more information aligned to that, which is very rich and important for us to capture. And obviously ministers are taking a very close interest in um, what we're seeing from your reports that are coming through to us. Okay, in terms of um, our figures, and these have remained static really throughout um, our tenure, th it, there are two key areas and numbers that we see consistently. Harm to babies, those under one, um, and older adolescents appear to be more prevalent than, in, uh, than any other age group in terms of what we see, and that continues to be the case. Um, and hence why our first national review, which uh, Dale will talk to, is about child exploitation. And the third recently announced uh, national review is on non-accidentally injuring children under one. Moving forward. Okay. Um, as we've moved forward and are capturing the detail in COVID um, de um, numbers, um, we've seen 19 rapid reviews that involve 20 children where COVID has been identified or been deemed to be influential in the serious harm or death of a child. And the key themes that we're seeing through those are mental health and obviously uh, children who are already suffering from mental health issues, uh, deterioration and or um, very sadly severe outcomes in relation to that changing family dynamics um, and obviously where we're now seeing families um, in lockdown together and the pressures that that can create in what may already be difficult circumstances and then obviously the consequences of stretch services and where services due to the nature of how they're having to deliver has changed that actually that's applying another pressure in relation to service delivery. Um, we've had We've had two cases of non-accidental injury in children whereby um, the, uh, that's been a direct result or seem to be um, a, a consequence of lockdown and the COVID issues. It is a really, um, it's a real summary of what we're seeing and very early days. And I need to emphasize that because one of the things as a panel we don't want to do is draw early conclusions that don't stand the test of time and make sure that actually what the information we're passing out to you is as good as we can get it. And obviously it's all reliant on the information that we see in the rapid reviews. Okay. Now, as we, use, as we move through the agenda, you will see that I'm now going to hand over to Dal Simons, who's going to talk about criminal exploitation, but you're going to have an opportunity to ask questions um, at various stages, but please ask away that, as I said at the beginning, it's really important that we all interact and, and do so as much as we can. So thank you very much, and I hand over to Dale. Thank you. And Dale, you're going to just give us a little overview of the pre-work questions and the response to some of those. Um, and I'll just quickly flick back to that so everybody can see uh, the content that went in. Good morning, I'm Dale Simon, I'm one of the panel members. Um, we will try as much as we can to pick up the questions naturally in, in, in our slide presentations where we, where we can. If that doesn't happen and we get to the end of our presentations and there's still some questions at the end, we'll try and pick those up separately. So in this session, we're just going to have some updates from myself, um, Peter and Mark, who have uh, who are leading um, our the national reviews at the moment. So um, firstly, I led the um, first um, national review that the panel conducted along with my colleagues, Karen and Mark. And um, you will know that that was published in, in March and it was into the criminal exploitation. 
um, and safeguarding issues. Um, I'm really not going to go through too much of the, the report because I know um, many of you, in fact, most of you will have read it and we've already started to see reference to um, the report and its recommendations in some of the rapid reviews that have come in post-March. So really pleased about that. But I did want to take um, the opportunity just to um, highlight some of the key findings um, from, from the report, just as a sort of a quick uh, reminder to you. And it might also prompt some, some questions. So um, really in terms of sort of some of the key findings, the known risk factors around vulnerability don't always act as predictors. And that's the fact that these group of children who are subject to this criminal exploitation aren't your normal, your usual suspects, only um, two of our group were actually um, known to social services, the rest weren't. Um, another big um, issue just to remind people about was about the um, impact of moving children away from the local area. Um, that we found effective in the short term. Um, however, without a wraparound, without a good wraparound, um, it doesn't protect in the long term because families will creep back to the areas and we found um, cases of families going back to the areas and unfortunately the young person um, then actually um, being killed. Um, also in terms of exclusion from mainstream schools and again we're not saying that exclusion causes criminal exploitation but what we are saying is that exclusion does escalate the risk um, and of manipulation by criminal networks. And so it's really important to think when it gets to that point where it is absolutely essential to exclude a young person from school, that to think about the wraparound support that they will get out of that protective environment. And then also um, just to highlight the importance of um, relationship-based practice, building um, trusted relationships, and trying to ensure that you make the most of reachable moments, such as points of arrest, school exclusion, physical injury, because we found that that, that point where you can reach that child is really important, and a lot of these children are really hard to reach, hard to meet, hard to, to reach to. Um, so, as we said, and I really want to highlight really more than the sort of the report itself, which as I said, you've all um, probably read by now, really just to um, draw your attention to the fact that through, through the review we identified a series of questions and challenges um, in four key areas that we think um, partnerships should be working on and be able to answer and we would really recommend that safeguarding partners look at their practice against the challenges that are set out in, in the review and think about how patterns of exploitation may be shifting as a consequence of COVID. That's what, what I want to say sort of about the, the, the contents of the review. Now, in terms of some questions, I know there were also some questions in the forum which were posted about where we, what's happened since the review. Um, so in terms of um, cases since the review, um, we've continued to see a um, kind of constant stream of um, exploitation cases in the 15 months since the um, review concluded. Um, we have saw a further 26 cases, um, similar um, breakdown in terms of who was involved. Um, 20, 25 of 26 were boys, um, majority were BAME. Um, we haven't seen um, any kind of upsurge in criminal exploitation cases uh, since the lockdown. But as Karen said, we are just really just keeping sight of what's happening and trying not to draw any conclusions before we've got up the, the full picture. Um, and in terms of the recommendations themselves and, and the response to them, um, we have already received a really um, a, a response from the Secretary of State welcoming the, uh, the recommendations. And since that, we've also been working across government with um, Home Office, Health, Education, uh, Ministry of Justice, 
on how best to take forward um, the recommendations. So it's a um, really exciting time and we're really looking forward to seeing some of these recommendations taken forward. I mean, just yesterday I was at a, uh, speaking at a round table about the, the national referral mechanism. So I think that's it for me. Um, and if that poses any more questions, we'll be happy to get back to those as well. I think now it's over to Peter. There are, there are some questions and I think if you have a look at them in the forum and then just click and respond. People are already adding responses as well. Uh, but that's good. Uh, and of course, uh, the, we're, we're coming to a Q&A session shortly after the uh, the next two presentations. So, um, uh, Peter, you're next. Peter Sidebottom. Thank you. <laughs> okay, well, thank you, Dale, for, for that update on the uh, Criminal Exploitation Review. Our second review uh, that we've recently published has been on uh, sudden unexpected death in infancy. Those of you who are familiar with serious case reviews and safeguarding practice reviews, indeed those who have read the, the triennial reviews and so on, will be aware. Can we go back to the previous slide, please, whoever's controlling them? Um, we'll be aware that the, uh, the, there are two peaks in the incident of serious and fatal child maltreatment, one in infancy and the other in adolescence. And so it's not too surprising that our first two reviews have looked at these two uh, different uh, age groups. And, and that our second review looked at sudden unexpected death in infancy. And this is a, a slightly unusual one because of course we're not here dealing with deliberate abuse or neglect of a child, but we are dealing with situations where uh, parental care, perhaps background neglect issues and so on, may be a contributory factor to some of these deaths. And it was one of the largest single groups of cases that we're seeing coming through in notifications and the rapid reviews. So we felt it would be really important to do this. We know that sudden infant death syndrome, the rates have fallen dramatically since the 1980s, and yet there's this very uh, troublesome group uh, where in spite of all the advice about safer sleeping and so on, it seems that parents, for, for whatever reason, are either unable or unwilling to follow this advice, and these babies die in what we recognize are unsafe sleeping environments. So we looked at sudden unexpected death in infancy in uh, families where children are recognized to be at risk of significant harm from abuse or neglect. And we looked in depth at a number of cases from across the country, uh, combined this with, with an international literature review, um, and, and, and so we're able to identify quite a number of sort of really pertinent points. And I think the key things that I would really want to draw out from this, first that we recognize the, the complexity of these families' lives, that, that often we're dealing with families where there are um, large uh, contexts of background vulnerability and risk. And you'll see, um, hopefully you'll be able to see enough detail on the uh, diagram on the right-hand side, where we've adapted the, the pathways to harm and pathways to protection model to look specifically at this issue of sudden unexpected death in infancy. And you'll notice that often these deaths are happening in families where there is that background context of underlying vulnerability. And then we notice that, that very often there are particular vulnerabilities, either in the infant, the, the child, or particularly in the family and the parents, a new partner comes into the family, there's background domestic violence, things like that. And then what often happens on the night in question is that there are uh, out of routine circumstances. Something is different so that the baby, for example, uh, is placed to sleep in the parental bed or the parent falls asleep on a sofa having um, had some alcohol or, or drugs or a whole range of different things. And that's what triggers the sudden unexpected death in infancy. So recognizing this, we can recognize that um, pregnancy itself is quite a reachable moment that, that we have the opportunity to engage with uh, pregnant mothers, with their partners, but we need to take these 
um, opportunities. And we need to be much more flexible in our approach to these families. It's no good just using the routine uh, lullaby trust leaflets and just giving that out and thinking that it will make a difference. We need to work on a relationship model of, of practice, engage with these families and recognizing, if we can go to the next slide, recognizing that this is an issue not just for midwives and health visitors, but it is a public health issue that, that crosses across uh, all practice. So social workers, police officers, housing officers, probation officers, we all have opportunities to build up those relationships, to reinforce the messages about safer sleeping, to be listening to families about the stresses that they're under and how they are coping with those so that we can perhaps be a, a, a bit more flexible, tailored, relationship based in the way we come in and support them. So out of this, we, we've come out with three uh, national recommendations. We've suggested two areas where we, we feel there's a need for further research. Um, but if you go and have a look at uh, the published report, you'll see those. And, and also within that, a number of questions that we're putting to uh, safe, local safeguarding partnerships to ask yourselves about what's going on in our area, how can we improve practice, uh, make it more appropriate to tackling this issue alongside all the other issues. So we're not saying, look, this has got to take priority, but it's something that gets built into our overall strategies for tackling neglect, for tackling background abuse, and so on. So that in a nutshell is the uh, review on sudden unexpected death in infancy. Again, we'll have an opportunity uh, to address some of the questions that people have been putting in, um, and I'll come back to that in our panel discussion shortly. So I think I'm now passing over to Mark. Uh, yes, you are, Peter. Uh, morning, everybody. Uh, Mark Gurry is currently on this social work member uh, of the panel and leading the third national review, which was formally launched in July uh, this year. Um, and that's a focus on non-accidental injury in babies under one. Uh, as Karen said earlier, it's one of the major case forms which comes our way and it's likely that we'll need to do other reviews um, into this group because it's such a significant factor. Uh, but this one, and as you see, we've had nearly 200 uh, reviews on uh, babies, young children harmed or killed um, since we started in June uh, 18. Uh, but this particular uh, review is going to focus on uh, men um, from two kind of perspectives. One, and colleagues across the country will be aware that very often in reviews, uh, men are talked about as being invisible, hidden, unassessed, unengaged in child protection uh, planning. And we need to kind of try and understand that some more. Um, as at the same time, as we know, they are often the perpetrators uh, of the harm in the first place. So that kind of tension between the, the causes of the harm and their unengagement in the safeguarding process is really the focus for uh, this review. And in particular, we want to kind of drill down into the backgrounds, motivation, psychology um, of those, those men. One of the things you know, that this review is designed to do is to look in detail at the abuse itself. So whilst all reviews will look at the functioning of the safeguarding system, um, they will look at the kind of background risk factors that were pertinent at the time of the incident. Uh, what they don't always do is look in detail at the actual uh, circumstances of the uh, abuse. Uh, and that's one of the things this review will be uh, majoring on. Um, we've appointed free field work reviewers and they are already making contact and some of you may be in this list uh, with a number 20 25 uh, cases have come across our desk since over the last year or so which we think will help illuminate uh, these uh, issues and they're make, making contact with you and conducting some uh, interviews with practitioners and family members um, in your uh, area uh, we've also appointed a clinical psychologist to work with us 
and we're asking him to help us in the construction of and the analysis of um, interviews with the men themselves. Most of these, or all of them, um, are now currently in prison. So we are working through the Ministry of Justice um, and the prison service to construct some interviews uh, uh, with them where we will want to, as I said, want to explore their backgrounds, their motivation, their psychology, but really try and understand what was happening in the moment um, of, of the uh, abuse. Um, and there was a question um, just about how cases get selected in, just, so just to pick that up, we are dependent on the work that comes our way. Um, so when we have, when we have uh, decided on a thematic review, as we have here, we will look at the number of cases which fall within that um, theme, and from that identify those cases which we think will best illuminate and illustrate some of the issues we want to uh, explore. Um, we've also got a literature review um, underway. The Fatherhood Institute is conducting that for us. And uh, two final things. Uh, we are looking still, um, and this is a call to all of you, um, we're looking still for any evidence, any reviews, any thematic uh, work that you have done that might help illustrate uh, this area of work. And if you have done that, please um, contact us or simply send us uh, the report. And secondly, we're looking for people who have already kind of thought about this and begun to get into some different practice and different service construction, uh, particularly to better engage men. Um, and because one of the things we'll want to do, as we did in the criminal exploitation review, is to examine areas of good or emerging good uh, practice. So please do let us know uh, about that. The review at some point will consist of some round table discussions where we'll start to share some of the findings we've gathered and we'll want to test that against some of the uh, practice that you can tell us about. So um, I think that's that's it uh, for now. The review's just kicked off um, so we're hoping it will be finalised come March of next year. Okay thanks Stu. Great. Thank you, Mark. Uh, uh, thank you, Dale, and thank you, Peter, as well. So there are a number of questions, and uh, I can see your panellists furiously responding to those. So we're, we're moving into a 15-minute uh, Q&A now, so a chance just to reflect on what you've heard from the national panel and an opportunity to ask any questions you have. Um, hi. Um, I'll, I'll start. Hi. hi. Thank um, you, um, my name's Connie Vessels. I'm from the Lambeth Safeguarding Children Partnership. I'm the um, partnership manager. Um, my question was around um, threshold, and it's quite a, a, a general question. Um, there are obviously the, two, uh, the, the key criteria for um, notifiable um, incidents, um, obviously where no abuse and neglect are suspected. And my question is around um, significant harm and um, I guess how to manage different partners, understanding of what uh, constitutes significant harm, um, particularly when you are talking about um, adolescence um, and contextual safeguarding and contextual harm. Um, the guidance is, I think, pretty crystal clear. Um, and my concern is um, twofold. One, on one hand, I, I'm not sure we're referring everything that should be referred, given the criteria. But secondly, if we were referring everything that we should be referring, we would probably need a, um, a spe specific team to, you know, to conduct possibly five or six rapid reviews a week. Um, and I know that that's an issue that other local areas are, are kind of grappling with. And I was just wondering if there was any, um, any further guidance or any plans to issue any further guidance for those um, I guess slightly more grey areas. Thank you, Connie. Uh, I think, Dale, is that a question for you? Yeah. Um, well, you'll know one of our recommendations is about looking at um, working together and seeing how it can be improved to assist in this area. I think there is, there is a real recognition that the definitions and the clarity it could it could be improved on so that is a recommendation that we're that we're looking at and taking forward we don't um yet have the answer but certainly we we recognize that this is an area where we need um we need some more clarity um on it and so we are committed to doing that 
in the near future. And, and that experience of uh, perhaps looking at what constitutes a rapid review and the sheer number, um, can you just throw any light in terms of the... Well, uh, well, yeah, I mean, you know, there, was, there, there were always going to be nuances around this. And I think that in terms of the definition, we, the, what, you know, serious harm, I don't think, what am I going to say? I, I don't think there was any real appetite, uh, appetite to change what we, we know by serious harm or death. I think there needs to be some clarification around that. I don't know if that will result in a massive upsurge as is being suggested because you know I think we would need to really look at that more but I don't think at the moment that is the real concern in terms of all the numbers go up or all the numbers go down the concern is are we doing enough to help um, safeguarding partners to make those difficult decisions and be confident in the decision that they come to because I think there is a lot of confusion around, are we doing the right thing? Is, does this case come within the definition, doesn't it? And I think that's what we need to help to clarify. Steve. Right. Yes. Um, it's Paul from uh, Surrey Safe Guarding Children Partnership. I'd like to ask a question about options for publication. Um, so the guidance really, and of course the, the letter, um, that was sent out from the panel regarding publication is really clear that the expectation is to publish. But I think in some cases, um, it would be useful to have options around publication. For example, where children have been seriously harmed, but um, thankfully have not been killed, but could be adversely affected or re-traumatized by publication, even though things are anonymous, but the cases are such that they are ready, file, ready identifiable. So it would be really helpful if we had a range of options with criteria in the guidance around publication. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, who'd like to pick up on that? Karen? Thank you, Karen. Yeah, um, I think as a panel, we see numerous um, completed serious case reviews, and now we're seeing local child safeguarding practice reviews. We are quite sort of um, consistent in our view that most of the reports that we see can be published. And, you know, when we consider as partnerships that it's about learning and how each partnership can learn from others around how to improve practice, as we move forward and, and the different types of reviews, which you know, we're going to go through in more detail in Mark's presentation shortly, uh, change and, um, and reasons are given for non-publication, we're going to see less and less and the learning becomes less rich. So as a panel, when we see them, our concerns are about how, in the main, how they're written and, and quite often the fact there's just too much detail. And, and actually, we... We try to be consistent to partnerships in saying, please start with a review that in your head you know you're going to publish and therefore you keep it anonymized. And I have to say, we're seeing more and more reports now where the quality is such that they are concise, they don't contain detail, and as a consequence, publication becomes less of an issue. We, there are literally a handful of cases that we've seen in the time we've been together where we were understood the reasons why they can't be published. I think we become overprotective and, and because we're so involved in the cases personally, um, some of the rationales we don't feel are that strong. I'm not sure whether that helps you in your answer, but it's the view we see centrally when we see so many of the reports. It's a very clear steer. Could I just add one further point to that, Steve? I think, I think oh, the... Yes. The other thing we do see is um, both with SCRs and now local child safety and practice reviews is where that partnership has um, and I realize that this is sometimes difficult but they've managed to engage the family from the outset and they've been very clear with the family about why the review is being commissioned and it's for learning so there's been a sort of management of expectation with that family around publication from the outset 
Now, I've recognised that there are all sorts of complexities about that engagement. And obviously, things can change over time in terms of vulnerabilities and risks. But again, that's something I think if partnerships can do from the outset, that will definitely help further down track. Because otherwise, occasionally, we've seen examples where almost as if when we got to publication this is sort of come out of the blue for the family and then there's some kind of um negative reaction right. okay um and uh mark you were going to uh pick up on one or two of the questions yeah it's just if, actually there's a few questions and comments that have come up in relation to the nar review which i could probably deal with in one hit if i could so um the refer reference to the uea research yeah we're familiar with that thank you uh, very much equally the hampshire work on uh, icon uh, which is a parenting program helping parents with um around the lack of sleeping issue for babies uh, we also from our, we're already in some conversation uh, with them and we'll, they will be part of uh, the review and the thinking there were some questions from uh, care, about care leavers, um, and we have looked at that, and we are one. We did think about a review that specifically focused on either young parents or parents as who were care leavers. Um, and whilst some of the parents in the study we are, we are going to do fall in that category, that's not the main uh, focus uh, for it. Um, but it might become something we look at. Uh, in the in the future you know, there's an interest amongst ourselves and I'm sure out there particularly for care leavers and the extent to which the care system prepares them for parenthood as well as adulthood um, and I think there is some work be, to be done in that um, space uh, somebody said uh, there was some transcript from uh, interviews with um, care leavers and parents and would be interested in the answers absolutely yes please if you can find a way of getting them to us please uh do so via aminas uh, will work uh, well thank you great thank you mark um so just chance for one or two further questions again if you want to come off mute and you can see uh, in the forum that the panel have been uh, furious in their efforts to respond and comment on the questions um, Steve, oh, reply as well. So, uh, if you think that uh, you need more information, uh, then speak up, um, or indeed just uh, carry on in the forum and add your responses. So, chance for what? Anybody want to? Steve, could I ask a question, please? Alison, yes. Alison from Essex here. I think it's very interesting what you say about publication, and I completely understand what you've said. And, and we now are being very clear right from the outset about publication. I think one of the things that we still struggle with um, uh, is engagement from the partnership, the three partners, and actually more um, organisational culture anxieties about the reviews and the publication, almost more than the families really, because uh, organisations have been very used to doing serious case reviews in a very particular way. And there is sometimes a sense that if we do a short review that doesn't have all of that detail in, even though we're stressing the learning, that that can be difficult for people to accept. And it's a similar thing when we get referrals coming in for reviews now. We're working very hard with our partners to consider carefully what they're referring in. But I think it's just to recognise that there is a sort of organisational cultural anxiety with some of this as well, whilst we change over into the new system. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that, Alison, and I think I will try and touch on that in, in the presentation coming up. David Jones? Yes. Can I say something? What's your name? David Jones? David. Hi, David. Hello. Um, I'm now chairing Health Watch. I did chair Leicester um, Safeguarding Boards, both adult and children, some while ago. Um, just a reflection on publication. When I was chairing the, the Safeguarding Board in Leicester, which was for six years, we published most of our reviews. But I would ask the panel to reflect very seriously on the extent to which we are contributing to a purient indulgence in looking at family problems. It's really important that we publish and learn from um, cases. But I really wonder whether it's necessary to parade families' dysfunctions in front of the public in an, in an environment in which there is an increased use of social media 
and uh, that this is contributing to a whole set of consequences within our whole society. There's a political drive to publish. I have no, I, no doubt that it's important that people are accountable, but how we make things public is important because it affects the environment in which we all live. And I would ask the panel to think carefully about how things should be published and whether it's necessary to parade in public the personal tragedies and circumstances of people whose lives have been affected by multiple things and not necessarily their own, as well as looking at the impact on professionals. Yes, we must learn, we must publish, we must study, but is it necessary always to, to be so specific and, and personal? And I say this with some force, because our world is moving into uh, uh, an environment as uh, a result of COVID, but also the populist politics that we're living in and the Black Lives Matter and all sorts of issues where these things are really influential and significant. And we have to look at the implications of what we're doing. So yes, publish, right. publish okay. the lessons, but please think carefully about the environment that we are feeding. Right. Uh, thank you. Thank Dad. you. Yeah. Can I, can I come in and response to that and also a couple of other things? But um, yeah. I think that's a really, really important point, David, and it's something that we, we as a panel have been very clear about, that the kind of detail that has typically gone into a serious case review does not need to be there, and it's inappropriate, and it's not respectful to children or families to be publishing long chronologies, lots of details of, of people's personal lives and so on. The focus of a safeguarding practice review is on the safeguarding practice. You need a certain amount of context to be able to understand that. But I think what we're really, really trying to push for is that, yes, have that context, but keep it focused on what is the learning for safeguarding Keep it focused on the professionals, the professionals' responses, the learning coming out of it, um, rather than on parading um, people's personal lives. So, so if we can do that right from the beginning, and I think it is a learning process as to how we do this, but they, I think the reports will be more readable, um, they will be more pertinent and much more focused on learning. So we're really with you on that, David, I think, in terms of trying to move this forward and get out of that mindset of long, serious case reviews that just go over in detail what happened and, and, and actually increase blame rather than learning. So, so that's what we've got on that side. Can I, can I just come on to another issue that... I think we're getting a bit of feedback from somebody who's off mute. Um, can, I, can I just come on to another issue that a number of people have posted, both in the pre-forum questions and as we've been going on, which is about the relationship between um, the safeguarding partners and the rapid reviews and um, the CDOPs. And, and the learning from child deaths. And I think this is really important that the two work in parallel and uh, are complementary. that obviously the child death overview panels get to see all children's deaths, not just those that are related to abuse or neglect. And it's really important at a local level that you have strong uh, links between the two so that you're not duplicating effort. We as a panel, have got a, a very good relationship with the National Child Mortality Database. And we're building on that and looking at ways that we can share learning, that, that, that we can uh, build on that so that um, it's, it's something that benefits everybody um, and that the, uh, our panel's work and the work of safeguarding partners in these rapid reviews and local child safeguarding practice reviews are very much focused on the safeguarding whereas the child death overview panels will take that much broader public health view of preventing all child deaths. So I hope that helps in response to those questions. To reintroduce us back to Mark Berry, who's going to talk about the uh, local safeguarding um, uh, review and uh, over to you, Mark. Thank you. Moshe just loading it. Somebody asked me which organization I'm from. Um, I'm from my own organization. I've had 40 years working in uh, social, children's social care the last 10 or 15 at um, senior management and consultant level. 
So this is to talk some more about, I mean, we've been getting into this conversation already, um, and this is to talk a bit more about child safeguarding practice reviews, set out some of our thinking and expectation, but really to have, and that's why we're doing this as a webinar rather than simply issuing guidance, we want to have a dialogue with you first um, about things around what appears to us around criteria-led decision-making, about the nature of some of the reviews that are being commissioned and constructed and the use of alternative review methodologies. Um, so these are our starting points that, uh, I mean, one of the things we are seeing is some really good uh, rapid reviews coming in and have done uh, over the last year or so. Some are thoughtful, reflective, very focused on uh, learning, um, brief but not too short um, and, and it's clear a lot of work and effort has gone into it and and a kind of uh, a, an approach which we like to see kind of develop and push through to uh, reviews when when further reviews are necessary key message and a key issue for us is that we want to accelerate truncate the timeline from that incident to analysis to dissemination um, of learning you will all be familiar with what have often been very, very lengthy gestation periods for um, serious case reviews, such that by the time they come out, the incident they were describing is a thing of the past um, and a distant memory for too many people. So we really need to work together on how we can shorten that um, uh, gap. So we need reviews that are timely, are proportionate, and I'll come back to that word uh, proportionate. Uh, and a focus on learning and learning which is widely accessible and again I'll touch again a bit more on the uh, publication issue. So just to start as we should always start with what does working together um, uh, say um, and it's there are two key paragraphs in uh, working together one which sets out um, what the uh, they demand that there should be a consideration of a local review when criteria are met. And then it goes on to say that, however, the meeting of that criteria does not in and of itself mean that a local safeguard and practice review must be commissioned. And this is, I think, a helpful move on from 2015 working together, which was very clear in saying, if this, this, and this is true, then you must do a serious case review. And there was little room for, there's no room uh, for uh, discussion or uh, debate about that. And a lot of our correspondence with uh, what was then at LSCBs was about were the criteria met or not met. And it was a very binary uh, conversation and a binary uh, decision. Uh, and the reason I emphasize that is because it still seems to us there is a bit of a focus on the first bit of this about whether the criteria is met rather than it was met. However, we need to consider some other things. So it's still a bit of, we are seeing in too many rapid reviews, a conclusion which is simply uh, criteria met, criteria not met. Uh, and that's what we're with. So part of this uh, discussion is about encouraging to move also into the second uh, issue about you know, well, so the criteria might be met, what therefore are we going to uh, do? So moving us on, Steve. Uh, so this is a kind of typical uh, issue for us that we've seen. So there's a decision made by safeguarding partners that the criteria is met and an LS SPR or review uh, is to be uh, commissioned. We then see that an independent author is to be identified, a panel is constructed, IMAs are completed, combined chronology is to be reproduced, and a report is to be produced. That sounds to me like a serious case review uh, process. Uh, we've had three, three uh, LC SPRs came to us uh, recently. Uh, two of them referred to incidents in 2018, took 12 months to be completed, and a further nine months or nine to ten months before publication and they average between them 33 pages uh, and i think one of the kind of key messages from this discussion and from this webinar is that an lc spr is not a serious case review by any other name um, we are looking for people to think about those reviews in a different and more creative uh, way in a way which will help you and help the system cut to the chase uh, a lot quicker. 
And another thing which might, I think, exemplify the issues here is that of the rapid reviews that have come our way, so far 79 uh, people, or oh, 79 reviews have concluded that they will be commissioning um, uh, an LCSPR. So far, only eight completed ones have come our way. Now, if you think that all of you went to safeguarding partnerships by September last year at the latest, that would imply that there are a lot of reviews in the system that are working their way through the system ready before they can be uh, finalized and published um, and would imply that they're working to a time scale not dissimilar to the ones uh, we've quoted here and possibly not dissimilar to those used for serious case reviews. Now, the other set of circumstances we see is where safeguarding partners decide that the criteria are not met but that a further review is necessary or warranted or would be helpful and then decide to do any number of different things. They, some call it a learner review, a multi-agency review, a window on the system, a practitioner workshop um, or a combination of each and um, all of these and they often we are presented with some uh, responses and with some proposed methodologies which um, are more creatively constructed, more imaginatively uh, constructed than we are seeing in the LCSPRs which I uh, talked about earlier. So if we move on, uh, Steve. So here's just a couple of examples, um, which you can see uh, for yourself, um, where firstly, where these are two, two different um, partnerships. First one where the local partners didn't agree with the recommendation from their own rapid review panel uh, because they felt the criteria was not met. Uh, so there was an agreement, a common ground that there was a further review was warranted, uh, but the, the uh, partnership, uh, felt it because the criteria was not met they do it as a learning review focus on some events around peer relationship difficulties and self-harm um, rather than doing an LCSPR. Uh, second uh, uh, example was a proposal that in this partnership what they would do rather than commissioning uh, um, a serious, uh, an LCSPR that they would get frontline senior managers from all the agencies involved. They'll take part in independently facilitated workshops. They'll evaluate current approaches to the families with complex needs and identify barriers to effective multi-agency work, and including information such sharing. Uh, now, I'll say a bit more about that in a minute, but just let me say at the moment, our response to both of those were good. What but very good responses to the to the circumstances that you were presenting with. We had no problem whatsoever uh, with, with those uh, proposed responses, save for the fact that they were not to be LCSPRs. So Stephen, if you move us on. Thank you. I, actually, uh, Mark, there is a question around uh, if uh, it's 143, those ones. How does the National Panel see their role in holding national bodies to account for national review findings and local review findings for national bodies? So you've talked about the criteria and so on and given some examples. Uh, will you be giving out further guidance on the uh, actual, when the criteria are hit? You, you talked about- Yeah, I think that's a slightly uh, different issue if I, um, if I may. Uh, yeah. But certainly, you know, part of our role, and Dale touched on it um, in relation to the criminal exploitation, you know, the nature of our reviews is that we are making um, uh, some national recommendations. That's you know what we're for, and of course, it is our duty and responsibility to follow up with those national bodies, central government, whoever is the responsible agency, uh, to to pursue their response to those um, uh, to those findings. We have had um, sometimes where local reviews have made national recommendations. Um, and there has been times when we have um, followed up on behalf of those partners, what those national uh, recommendations were. Sometimes to be, we've gone back to the partnership and said, look, you, you can talk to the home office or you know, whoever it is um, as easily as, as we can. Often it will depend on whether the recommendation is in our experience indicative of a broader national issue, um, in which case it's more likely that we will uh, pick it up uh, and run with it and push um, 
on behalf of that partnership, but more, you know, more nationally uh, for a response um, yeah. on it. Um, so to be kind of be clear about where we have got to um, in, in this. So first of all, you know, it is clear uh, that we want to really emphasize that element, which I quoted at the beginning about uh, working together, that meeting the criteria is only the first set of thinking that needs to be done by local uh, partnerships, that we want people to move away from the criteria is met, so therefore, you know, we want to get people to, and everybody into a place where the criteria are met and our further considerations takes us to uh, these, these following kind of conclusions about what we should be doing uh, next. Our second position is to say that when a further review is warranted, uh, then they should always label those reviews as a local child safeguarding practice re review, regardless of the approach taken to complete it. And we'd want to see, and are seeing in a lot of instances, a methodology chosen for a particular review that's best designed to surface the issues in the, in the heart of it. And to go back to that earlier list, I mean, don't physically take us back to but to that earlier list of multi-agency reviews, learning reviews, windows on the system, we're perfectly relaxed about that, perfectly comfortable that they are likely to surface and to explore the issues that are required. Uh, but what they don't do is, first of all, gain the views of, uh, necessarily always gain the view of the frontline practitioners, and they don't necessarily gain the view of the families. And obviously those are two central requirements within uh, working together for local child safeguarding practice. Uh, reviews and voices which I know from some of the comments and questions people are making today uh, voices that without which reviews are not complete so move us on um, reviews should be proportionate you those of you and the number of you have had letters uh, from us saying yes we agree that you should do a review and it should be proportionate and that's become a bit of a code word for for us it's a word that is used in working together uh, but it's when we say proportionate we mean it should be focused on the core issues uh, of the case and not and just to emphasize uh, Peter's response to David Jones's uh, very uh, pertinent and important question about publication, uh, that too many serious case reviews in the past, and indeed some of the early local child safeguarding practice reviews, in our view, contain an unnecessary amount of detail about internal family life. Um, and internal family functioning and, and, and interestingly enough uh, becomes the reason then why some partnerships don't want to publish because the report contains an unnecessary amount of detail um, about, about family life and so often our response uh, to those partners about both serious coach views and it will be let me say about future uh, local child safeguarding practice reviews will be to say uh, if you are wanting to not publish it because the report contains a lot of family uh, detail, then we will say that's an unnecessary amount of detail which you didn't need in order to get at the learning for the safeguarding system um, and actually had the report been written in a more focused and proportionate and shorter way with a focus on identification and dissemination of learning then actually we wouldn't be having a conversation about publication uh, or not. And so our default position is always um, that reports and learning reports should be uh, published. And we are still getting serious case reviews which are winding their way through to the, through the system and still having at each panel one or two serious case reviews which are coming to us where partners are saying we don't want to publish because of um, x y and z sometimes we'll say we produced an executive or shortened uh, report which we're ready to put into the public domain we will have often said actually your shortened report was perfectly good um, and helpful summary of the events and perfectly well captured the learning so it could have been your main report um, uh, all along 
along. Um, because what we're trying to move away from um, and what these reviews are trying to move us away from is that detailed chronological, this happened on Monday, that happened on a Tuesday, this happened next week, which generates great lengthy uh, reports uh, and very difficult to, to, um, to kind of get into and, and extract the learning from. So that's where we've got to. We want, as I said, we want uh, people to think beyond uh, criteria simply we want to think about we want people to think more creatively about how they could use different methodologies to uh, surface the issues they want to uh, get at we want people to think about how they can generate reports which are much more timely and accessible which do capture the voices of frontline staff and um, families and which can then be uh, published and put into the public domain because then that's how uh, that learning is becomes available to the rest of the system. Thank you Mark. Um, there are a number of questions. Um, let me just pose one for you that uh, is actually uh, this version is reflected in a number of other questions. It's number 155. Uh, and it says a key factor in the delay for publication is criminal proceedings. Uh, with, with police CPS asking for reports not to be published uh, in some areas, police don't want SCRs or LS, uh, LCSBRs to commence until criminal proceedings are complete. Uh, what is the national panel's position on publication prior to criminal proceedings being completed? Yeah. So um, the CPS have a, a, a protocol which they wrote in 2014. We've been working with them. Um, to revise that so that they have a better understanding of the um, safeguard and review uh, uh, process um, because there was a, a, a bit of misunderstanding about the impact that the two proceedings could have on each other. So they shouldn't be now routinely just delaying uh, reports as a matter of course. There should be a consideration of the issues in that, in that case and whether they really do impact on the criminal proceedings. And it's only in those cases that the, the um, SDR should be delayed. And when we went through the process of actually looking at the number of cases, which would really be adverse, the number of criminal cases really uh, adversely impacted, it's very small. So the thing is, if you are being told to delay and you're not happy, you can push back and challenge and ask for the decision to be um, reviewed by the uh, local um, chief crown prosecutor. They shouldn't be delaying them just as a matter of course. Thank you, Dale. Yeah. Um, there's also a question I'm going to ask, which is 202, and, and then I'm going to throw the floor open. We've got time for um, two or three uh, questions uh, directly from the participants. Uh, uh, it's number 202. Please could we clarify that local learning reviews do or do not need to be published? This is very significant. Mark, do you want to pick that up? Yeah, okay. I think um, uh, Okay, so I think what we're saying is something slightly uh, different, which is to say this. A rapid review is convened and completed. If a rapid review concludes that there is further learning to be gained from explore, exploring the issues in the case then that further than can be explored within the confines of a uh, rapid review and partners therefore decide to commission a further review. Our view is, and the, the point we're making in this presentation is to say that any further review should be a local child safeguard and practice review um, and with a with a freedom to explore some of the methodology and the process by which that review is completed and i saw for example somebody in the chat said they did their review via a, a, some drama workshops which involved over a thousand people well you know i think there are ways of doing that kind of which sounds fantastic by the way but it's uh, there are ways of doing that writing those up in a way which are still uh, publishable so the art uh, so the response to the question isn't our learning reviews um, to be published it's more if there is a review then they become local child safeguard and practice reviews and those reviews then become published 
Okay, thank you, Mark, for that clarification. Um, we've also got Lorraine Parker, who's uh, asking. Yeah, for sure, Lorraine. To come in. Um, Lorraine, you're going to make a comment about CPS and NPCC? Yeah, it might be just helpful not on Dale's point that two aspects to the, um, you know, the slowing up of um, the learning because of um, ongoing live investigations. So NPCC own the responsibility for the updating and rewriting of that CPS protocol, which has been agreed with the CPS and we just were in the list of being about to be published. So that will go out um, through our policing facilitation to all of our safeguarding leads locally and the National Homicide Working Group. Um, but I, I would like to say something about how you apply this locally. So it's all very well having the protocol. We've always had the protocol, but it's always been slowed up. <laughs> So it's how you um, activate the new three-way uh, responsibilities in your partnership, I would suggest. So if you are stuck in a position where you feel the learning could be, um, you know, accelerated or improvements could be made, I think you need to think about what's the process of escalation within your own partnership for doing just that. Your chief constable is your safeguard partner in all of your 132 partnerships. And if this is being, um, continue to be held, held up, uh, don't accept that position. You should question it and try and find your way through the system. And it's the partners as a three-way with their relevant agencies to really get a bit of fight on this. And, 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 and uh, don't always accept what you're told in, 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 on, you know, first time round. It may be entirely appropriate that it's held up, but it may not. And I think you should be encouraged to explore that. Thank you, Lorraine. Uh, Karen, do uh, you have a response to that? Just very briefly, um, as I say, my background is policing and as an ex-senior investigating officer, sometimes you will find that these police officers will say things to you and they're not backed up in reality. Now, they, that's because they're being overprotective about their cases. And this guidance, which the panel has been involved in at the early stages because it was so out of date to get it revised, is your armour. Please know about it. And when you sit down with police saying you can't do things, then please utilize it. Because sometimes what they're saying is not backed up in fact. And, you know, and that's me saying that as a cop. <laughs> Great. Okay. Um, any other questions, comments? We've got a few minutes to uh, continue on the uh, LCPSLs. Hi, I've got a question. It's Julie Upson from Wiltshire. Thank you, Julie. Um, in relation to local CSPRs, there's an expectation that there's a level of independence um, for these reviews. And it'd be, I'd just be helpful to explore that a bit more. What does that actually mean? We don't want to get back to a point where we're having to always appoint an external reviewer. So what, what are our options, really? Thank you. Who'd like to pick that up? Mark? Well, yeah, thanks, Julie. I mean, I was, you know, looking at working together. There's a section, Commissioner Review or Reviewers for Local Child Safeguarding Practice Review. Um, the only uh, comment it makes about this is uh, that safeguarding partners should consider whether the reviewer has any real or perceived conflict of interest. Now, I don't think, therefore, that means... Uh, you have to commission an, an, in, an external independent uh, author, as has been the case in the past. It means you have to have a reviewer who's not got reveal or real or perceived conflict um, uh, of interest. So there is scope for people within the local system uh, to lead on uh, these reviews. Thank you, Mark. Another question. Hi, it's Janine Davis here. Hi, Janine. Hiya, from Listen Up Research. Just wanted to ask a question really in relation to how, um, you know, authors and just reviews and, and I guess across the board are going to be more accountable in relation to the way they're written, especially around issues around institutional racism and suppressive practice. I feel it's something which consistently seems to be missing. And I, um, I'm just thinking about just the, especially the work around criminal exploitation and the fact that we know that I think 15 out of the 21 
um, you know, young men identified with from minoritized communities. So I think it'd be really great to just see how can we ensure that local authorities and all partners involved are really being held to account more, but also the authors themselves who are writing these reviews in relation to the messages which come out around racism or other oppressive practices. Yeah, I was just, um, th thank you for that question. I, and you know, it's very, very timely. I, I mean, I, there, there is actually quite a, it's not a, it's not a, a sort of person specification at all, but within working together, it does give quite a, quite a bit of detail about expectations of the professional knowledge and the ability to communicate and engage. Uh, this is in terms of the reviewers. So the types of people that you'd expect safeguarding partners to commission. Um, I mean, it's not explicit about the issues that have just been raised, but I think, it, you know, if, you, if you're competent in terms of being able to engage, then the expectation would be that would be across all groups. Um, so ho hopefully that is that is helpful. And as I say, is, is, is a good, useful reference point for, for safeguarding partners. Yeah, I think that's right. Janine, um, um, you and I had a conversation about this recently, didn't we? And I, I think, you know, a couple of things, I mean, you know, clearly there is an onus on partnerships when they receive a review from whomsoever you know it becomes their review and it's for them to satisfy themselves that it covers the key issues to the standards and quality that they um, expect and that there is a lens on um, uh, on the kind of issues you were raising uh, Janine and that that those issues are properly articulated um, uh, and explored and equally you know it behoves us nationally to do the same with our uh, reviews um, and you know certainly it's something that's in my mind very strongly for the uh, for the NA NAR review I spoke about. Steve, can I come in? Yes please, sorry who are you? VJ Patel. Oh hi VJ. Yeah we had a discussion a few weeks ago at PASP and as a board manager I've had to really work hard to find BME reviewers because actually uh, we don't recruit, but nobody uses them. There's a real reluctance. So whilst the National Council think, oh, partnerships should do this, there's a bit about a risk culture saying we go for established people who've done SCRs before. So actually, we found people who are doing it, but they don't so we take on a risk, which is fine. But actually, I do really ask this question where people are willing to take on that risk in terms of looking at recruitment of and actually facilitation those BME reviewers, to which will actually then start bringing those issues around inequality, discrimination, racism, oppression. Yes. So that, that, that's a very important point about that diversity within the reviewers. And uh, I know it's a question you've been tackling. Certainly we tackled it on the uh, TAS webinar. Uh, thanks for that, VJ. Um, it, it, perhaps, I, I mean, the, the panel can respond, but I'm just interested if there are other people who have begun to tackle this and any good practice or experience they've got uh, from seeking out uh, uh, reviewers from uh, different, different ethnic backgrounds uh, and cultures. Anybody had a success or a recent... Hi, it's uh, Betty Lynch here. Can you hear me? Yes, Betty. Thank you. Uh, yeah, it's Betty Lynch here from Slough. I'm chair of the Slough Safeguarding Practice Review Group. Um, we don't really use that kind of specific approach in terms of recruiting people from a BAME community. It's very difficult to do that if you come at it from that point of view. Mm. But what we do do is every time we have an SPR, well, I've done this in the past as well, and we just have one running at the moment. And what we did with that case was we devised specific procurement standards. Uh, for commissioning SPR that were agreed across the partnership in terms of the quality and the experience that that person has had and also their experience in writing reviews of all sorts, not just in writing SPRs. I'm not sure if that's helpful, but it's just a matter of looking yeah. at this a bit more laterally in terms of the breadth and the range of a person's experience, their ability to work with a very diverse community, with a very diverse workforce, it's absolutely critical to us. But their experience around SPRs is critical to that. So I think it's really important for each and every time you launch into the SPR process that you think very carefully about each author differently, bespoke to that particular case and make sure you you know you you commission appropriately it's not easy to do though uh, because you need a broad range of consensus around the table and you need to make sure that that particular author suits 
particular learning you know so mm. yeah so that's it really thank you betty uh, and there's also comments in the zoom chat about uh the focus on the right skill set uh in order for those lessons dale did you want to make a comment yeah i wanted i think it's i mean it was vj's point i think it's really important to think about the diversity of the of your reviewers um and certainly in terms of the national um pool we have looked at sort of the terms of reference for that to see if actually it's unnecessarily um restrictive so that we can open it out to people from other backgrounds who've got good investigative um, investigative skills but not necessarily in the social care background because if you keep fishing in the same pool and you keep looking for the same skills you will get the same people and that we cannot continue in a situation to say oh well there's nothing we can do because we're just looking for the best in that field so i think that there is more that certainly we're doing at a national level to ensure that we widen the base of our pool and i think that local areas should look to do more themselves Steve, can I make a comment? Yes, please. Um, my name is Suzanne Alwick. I'm Head of Strategic Partnerships at London Borough Waltham Forest. Um, I think in terms of um, diversity, that's a really um, important um, issue. And I think it can kind of link with um, thinking about how we use the skills and knowledge and experience of our workforce within our partnerships. Mm -hmm. So we're just about to undertake, we're undertaking a review and um, we have a designated nurse from within the CCG who doesn't work in our borough but works in the one of the boroughs as part of the CCG alongside um, a school professional from within children's social care both of whom have had no contact or um, no um, you know would be seen to be um, uh, would be seen to be independent so I think there is something about utilizing knowledge and experience within our partnerships and with agencies that are on a broader footprint than the local authority that is kind of easier to do I think also there's something about us having the um, having the innovation and the bravery to think about how we can upskill people and we had tried to have a conversation with the London Safeguarding Children's Board about doing something collectively in London around identifying what are the skills and knowledge so that um, people within our partnerships could actually undertake reviews um, unfortunately there wasn't a, a lot of interest in that but I do think that is some of the way um, in which we're going to work through these issues um, and also um, do it in a, a way that uses our resources in the best possible way. Great, uh, thank you very much for that. Um, I, I'm going to propose just perhaps one final comment. Mark, do you want to close that out? Um, and of course, encourage you, we're going to go into breakouts very shortly. So I think uh, th this uh, issue of uh, diversity and review panel should uh, be taken into that discussion as well. But I'll introduce that shortly. Mark, just a few closing comments on uh, Alessia Bihars. Yeah, thanks, Steve. Um, I suppose, I don't know where people want to break, so I will be really quick. But I think for me, one of the kind of themes that's coming up in the, in the conversation and in this latter part in particular is about having a confidence that you, you as partners are both identifying a process and a methodology and a lead reviewer, whoever that might be, and I, I think the points made from Waltham Forest are really helpful, uh, that are best likely to surface the concerns and the issues and the learning uh, that's, that's required. And you know, there's a real need to put behind us the kind of safeguarding review uh, kind of methodology and thinking and construct and get into a different and uh, more creative and focused way of conducting reviews into serious safeguarding uh, incidents. Good, thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. I, that was a fascinating session. We're up to over 280 comments and questions now in the forum. So. Um, there's an awful lot for the panel to uh, review and go through after this as well. Peter's already smiling about the prospect. And um, I just want to offer people just a very short break uh, before we go into... Welcome back. Um, 
thank you for once again the uh, those of you who managed to stick to the process and uh, add content into the five topics we posed. Um, we're really trying to emulate the, the sort of conference uh, coffee break where you get into a huddle with perhaps people you know or you don't know and you reflect on the topics during the conference. And uh, hopefully most of you stuck to one or two of these topics, but we also appreciate that people may have just chatted more generally um, about safeguarding issues um, what we're hoping is that uh, in, irrespective of the um, appropriateness of the topics, that you capture your feedback so that the national panel can pick up on it. And uh, whilst you were away in your breakout rooms, the panel were uh, furiously again looking at the content. Um, and I'm going to ask them for one or two reflections. Um, but just before we go there, just invite anybody who um, had a uh, particularly good um, discussion in their breakout room just to reflect on that and tell us what you talked about. Anybody want to come off mute and uh, tell us what they discussed? I'll go if you want, Steve. It's Julia. Thank from you, Julia. Hi, yeah. Um, we, we looked at, we, we felt actually that the questions were not questions that we particularly um, look at being a, a, as the problems or the things that we actually wanted to discuss. Um, we did discuss publication and the need for perhaps more flexibility around that when there are high profile cases that affect vulnerable children and families. Um, so we did touch on that. Um, some of the things that we did discuss was um, the um, issue of um, care leavers, or not particularly care leavers, actually just um, over 18s really would be in any sort of CSE, gangs, um, child protection, any kind of child service activity um, and the lack of review around those children. We think there's a lot of learning there and they fall between the gaps. They don't meet any, anybody's criteria for a view, review there. Um, and for us as board managers or partnership managers we're trying to bring everybody together with this transition and you know services are still quite you know in silo in some areas if the national panel were to look more at that kind of transition or you know nationally if we're looking at more of a, um, a cradle to grave um, then it, it might be a bit easier for us as board managers the other um, area that we looked at was actually um, just the fact that we were getting more recommendations, we, we have the same conversations, we know that there are the same issues and the same recommendations come out every single time. Um, we actually, what would help us is how to resolve those issues. Um, so we are kind of struggling at local levels or regional levels, looking at um, different ways to address information sharing, anybody? Or, or things like that. Um, so actually what would help us is really good practice, is good best practice good examples um, rather than more recommendations really excellent thank you julia um and can i invite you to reflect and pick up on what you've seen about the, the group one topic around flexibility of approach and identification of the methodology sorry was that to me steve yeah sorry yes Sorry, you broke can i okay. just reference to Julia what she's just yeah. said interestingly as a panel we've started to have conversations about how do we work on those wicked problems like what is good information sharing what's good risk assessment between agencies and maybe that we start doing some themed focuses in those things looking at practice so it's interesting you brought that up Julia I think it's really pertinent actually um, I was asked to look at the commentary from topic one, which was around flexibility of approach and identification of methodologies for reviews. I think building on what Mark said in his presentation, there's some real honesty in this, which is the only way forward, isn't it? A recognition that part, a lot of partners are still sticking to what they know well, so the serious case review methodology, but actually knowing that you've got to move forward on it um, um, one comment here, which I think is really strong about, we only look at outcomes and learning. So focus on that as the review, focus on embedding that learning and changing practice. Um, um, positive about the rapid review process has helped in them doing that because you're doing it faster, which was all part of the wood review, wasn't it? What's the point of a serious case review four years down the line, um, as opposed to what is the practice that we need to influence now? Um, learning is key, whatever the model you use, 
Some of this will come at the rapid review stage and as a panel we see that definitely. Um, talking about multi-agency workshops delivered from a rapid review to enhance practitioner understanding of key areas of practice, for instance, coercive control, you know, something that's really at the fore at the moment and seen a lot as part of the issues within uh, rapid reviews. Targeted thematic discussions that lead to further recommendations on training provision, some really positive things that are do being done across the piece. Dif differing methodologies can be tricky for practitioners to familiarize themselves, feel confident in, so possibly an argument for some consistent methodology. Now, part of that is around proportionality, isn't it? What's the big case with a lot of learning versus a case where you can see what that learning is and quickly disseminate it and move it forward into practice? So, you know, um, and the commentary is just going on and on, and hopefully we're going to capture all that for you so you can utilize it. But I've just given the overview on that one. Okay. Great. Thank you, Karen. That's just what we asked for. And the, uh, yeah, the, the ability to continue during the next 10, 15 minutes uh, and then perhaps beyond uh, the webinar uh, in order that those of you who are perhaps uh, reflecting or consulting with colleagues can also add their comments and feedback on these uh, topics. Um, Dale, can you give us a quick overview of the, what you've seen coming from topic two on uh, what might the circumstances in your view uh, when a review other than an LCSPR is warranted? Yeah, well, I think, I think the first uh, um, comment would be that clearly um, we kind of find it a bit difficult because they just would get into groups with, you know, they just had Mark's presentation and then starting to think around it. So, so in terms of the question, um, finding it quite sort of difficult to get straight into the question in, in that way. Um, however, there was some um, discussion about sort of, you know, the, the uh, rapid review versus you know, robust uh, rapid reviews versus the um, um, LCSPRs. And I just want to just put up, you know, just clarify one point which was raised there, which I completely disagree with, which is that, well, if we're going to have um, rapid, you know, if we're going to, everything's going to need to be an LSC, LSCPR, why bother with the rapid review? Well, the thing that is a statutory requirement is the rapid review. That's what you must do. And the more robust the rapid review, it can actually take some of the work out further down the line. So we have seen examples of really good rapid reviews where they pulled out the learning and then they said, oh, we think we might need a better. We're saying, actually, you've done the learning, now get on with implementing. So quite the opposite to the, po the point that was posted, which is go on to the LCSBR and forget the rapid review. It is robust rapid reviews will help you to identify the learning, whether you can just move straight on to the implementation if you've identified the learning, or whether you do need a further review to pull out more of the learning. Um, so uh, that's probably what, what came out. And, and so it, most of it was around sort of rapid reviews. There was one point around um, clarification about publication, but we can pick that up in, in um, waiting for some guidance and public publication. Thank you. Thank you, Dal. Um, just a pause. If anybody wants to dive in and review, um, respond, uh, or if you picked up on question one or two, um, indeed, any comments, insights, questions? Just offering you a chance. Steve, to... it's Alan, Alan Caton. Can I come? Hello, Alan. You? Hi. Uh, yeah, we, we had a discussion around topics one and two, and I think it was fair to say there is still some confusion around, you know, when it becomes a local safeguarding practice review and when it doesn't and what, what it should be called. But I think Mark has made that quite clear today. And obviously there are a lot of different methodologies out there now. Um, and I think some people, as it said in there, are still stuck in the old serious case review way and I wonder whether something the panel could do was be share some good practice around you know good sharp methodologies that really are are there to quick pick the pick out the learning and um, I guess there is something around also with local reviews so if you're going to go through a rapid review it doesn't meet the criteria but you're still obviously whatever you do becomes a an LSCPR um, should we update the, the guidance to say actually these should all be published anyway uh, just a thought that came out of our group meetings uh, around those particular 
discussions just to make it yeah. easier because there's so much you know uh, room for maneuver and I guess and, and going back to some points uh, people made earlier that there's probably so much stuff out there that, that doesn't even get referred into the partnership let alone to the panel so yeah. it's just just a thought great thank you and, and there's, a, there's a comment or two in uh, the zoom chat around that as well uh, one from Kate Nightingale saying out of eight rapid reviews in Devon two have needed uh, to lead to uh, CSPRs uh, the learning is identified at the rapid review stage um, we do challenge the timescales at times in order to do the best job uh, of this though. So again, rapid reviews uh, revealing uh, the necessity for an LCSPR. Steve, um, could I, Steve, could I come in? It's Alison here from Essex. Just yes, Alison. And then David, I'll come to you next. Um, one of the things that we talked about in, in our group was around some, some of the difficulties and moving people on. Um, and I wonder, based on what Alan's just said about support from the national panel, whether there could be some work done nationally with the partners. I understand locally we have to do the influencing, um, but actually so that the partners, health, police, social care, all understand nationally that what the new requirements are, because it, I think this culture shift is really quite a challenge to achieve just locally. I think it would be really helpful if something more national could come out. I don't know if there's already been national guidance to health and police. It might be that that's the case, but that doesn't seem to be filtering down so much locally. Yeah. Um, would anybody like to respond to that from the panel or should we move on to Sarah, who's gonna look at topic three? I think I, I could just sort of chip in there. It's, it's something we've been very aware of as a panel is, is how do we engage in this kind of conversation and, and Get, get people um, thinking through this kind of culture shift. And we're, and we're sort of very aware there's 150 odd safeguarding partnerships, each with three partners. That's 450 organizations to engage with to start with. But, but we really see you as, as, as a sort of central to this. That, and, and this webinar is, is a first step into how do we continue this conversation, actually draw on local expertise uh, to help develop that culture and, and, and get it spreading out. So we'll keep looking for ideas, but, but please do keep them feeding back to us. Right, thank you, Peter. Uh, David, you had a comment. Yeah, we, we um, had a discussion about serious case reviews. I'd firstly, to say thank you to the, the panel for this creative um, way of engaging with people. Um, but we, we felt SCRs had been going down a blind alley, just repeating the same messages and not creating any change. Um, so what does that actually say? And I think um, from my experience being an inspector in some of the inspectorates, as well as doing um, a range of other things over the last 20, 30 years, I don't think we appreciate how different a, um, local um, agencies are and dip local cultures. Um, often we get stuck in the one where we're working and we don't realize how different and they are very very different and what are the organizational factors which create the difference in practice and we're rather too sensitive um, I think we're too reluctant to comment on management style and practice um, that's around supervision it's around the culture of learning it's around the stability of the workforce it's around the degree of, of uh, recognition of the complexity of the work, the skills that are required, the investment in, in people that is necessary to make all this happening. I see lots of people nodding on the screen as I'm talking, and yet we don't really talk about it. And surely that's the issue that we need to get to grips with. What is it that creates an environment in which people work together and have the confidence to engage with families and circumstances in the degree of complexity that's involved? It's far too mechanistic. It's far too procedurally driven. And if the, the panel can stimulate that sort of reflection and lift the, the whole sense of what we're engaged with, then we can make a real difference. Um, and, uh, but that requires a lot of courage. Um, and uh, I, I, I think the panel could, now I have a lot of confidence from the way you've been talking, that you can help lift this debate. I could give you examples of local authorities I've been in um, where there were good, um, good things happening. And even in the best authorities, people are sometimes reluctant to talk about it because they fear if they're too, um, too upfront, they'll be knocked back next time round. And um, 
this, we've got to change this sort of culture of organization and constantly focusing on the individual cases I don't think is going to give us new learning frankly. Mm. Uh, can I just comment on that um, Stu? I'm, I completely <laughs> agree with that um, uh, Dave and it's one of the reasons you know without coming back all over it again one of the reasons we're saying what we're saying about the nature of reviews those reviews which focus into the minutiae of of a chronological detail about family life and family events are not helpful in surfacing the kind of learning that's that's required. Um, and I think you're right, we have a contribution. We can't fix this on our own, but we have a contribution to make to this, this issue and about, you know, leadership and culture is at the heart of good safeguarding practice. We've kind of known that for a long time. And if you see in our criminal exploitation uh, review the challenges that we've made to local areas to reflect on does ask them to think self-critically about the culture within which their frontline staff are operating their approaches and appetite to risk management and to uh, risk aversion and risk intervention you know is where people are asked to to look at that and think carefully and in a kind of self-challenging way about what it's like for their frontline staff doing that really difficult work in their areas. Yeah, Peter's come back on that. Just another point, constantly focusing on the cases that have gone wrong and not doing anything around looking at the cases um, that have worked well or the authorities. We need to go, go and look at one or two authorities that don't have many reviews. What is it? Are they hiding them <laughs> or are they actually getting it right? And um, uh, inspection used to do that better than it does now, I think. Sorry, too, going on too long. No, that's fine. I, I think those, those are very interesting topics to uh, review, perhaps for subsequent events like this, um, to get a much wider uh, view of, as you say, what's going on in authorities that uh, have fewer reviews or no reviews. Thank you. Um, Sarah Elliott, I'm going to ask you just to review what you saw from topic three coming up around in what ways would an alternative review differ from a proportionate um, LCSPR? What did okay, you I'll, do this, I'll do this really briefly because I'm uh, conscious that we've, we've covered quite a lot of this ground and we're, we're yeah. you know, trying to tie up some loose ends. So I won't repeat what others have said, but a, um, a, a few interesting additional themes. So um, definitely something coming through around dissemination of learning when actually um, a safeguarding partner hasn't commissioned a local child safeguarding practice review. And I guess we've seen some great examples of where safeguarding partners are working across boundaries, building their networks, potentially sharing um, learning events on a, a wider footprint than purely their own area. So all of those things help, I think, as well as the, the more sort of standard publication of a local child safeguarding practice review. Um, I think there's something about um, colleagues feeling that the actual rapid review, review methodology is very helpful. Um, I think we've got to be a little bit careful about language here because there definitely seems to be quite an appetite to use the methodology for other types of incident reviews, which is great. Um, so, you know, using things like root cause analysis, decision trees, etc. I guess it's just a little caution of they're not labelling all those things rapid reviews as well, or will compound some of the other issues that we talked about. But great that people are finding and practising using different approaches within their rapid review methodology. And I think the final thing is that's come through is around thematic rapid reviews. Um, and certainly in the safeguarding uh, partnerships that, that, that I chair, although they're not in England, um, you know, we've, we've had, and we use the rapid review methodology, but we will, we'll, we'll have some sort of clusters of cases and rather than just hold one rapid review uh, for each individual case, we've, we've actually been able to set those up using a thematic approach. And, and then I think finally, really, a number of the points that have come through that will are really valuable for us in terms of how we can pick those up within the next publication of the practice guidance. Okay. Lovely. Okay, Peter, uh, just uh, give us an overview of what you've seen from topic four, um, yes. potential difficulties in completing LCPSRs. Yeah, so, so this was a question relating to completing the uh, local child safeguarding practice reviews using different methodologies and still capturing the voice of uh, practitioners and family. And a couple of the comments here 
we're really sort of emphasizing that this point that this is about a culture shift and and it's already been picked up in in our discussion so far that it is a culture shift and culture shift takes time and i think we need to recognize that and not be disheartened i think we have already seen some shifts in culture um, the, the 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 emphasis on systems-based approaches the emphasis on capturing and listening to the voices of children and families to the voices of practitioners it's starting to get there but we need to keep hammering away at this and we need to keep emphasizing look the child needs to be central we need to listen to what uh, families are saying we need to listen to what practitioners are saying we need to move the shift away from blame around individual activities to thinking about the deeper systems issues so there is that ongoing cultural shift i think one of the key things or two of the key things that came out in the comments on this topic were around the differing expectations so there are issues for practitioners around their own emotions, around anxieties and fears, around needing, needing to move on uh, from the incident. And all that, I think we need to recognize, acknowledge, we need that supportive base for practitioners because uh, however hard we try to sort of say, look, this isn't about just blaming the individual, there is a part of that. And I think practitioners do feel very vulnerable. And so having that support, listening to them, engaging with them, really important. There's also that sort of difficult balance between the expectations of the family and often they are wanting what they see as justice. Um, and again, that is not the role of the safeguarding practice review. And we need to sort of somehow manage that accountability. And hence, I think the importance of doing it as a safeguarding practice review involving the family and publishing because that does give some of that accountability and transparency, but really being clear that this is a process of learning. Um, and so uh, building that in right from the beginning in terms of the scoping, the terms of reference, working with the reviewer to ensure that's at the heart of it. So I think I'll, I'll leave it at that as some of the key points that came out of that discussion. Right. Right. A uh, short pause if anybody else wants to uh, respond or uh, highlight a point that they captured uh, during their discussion or, and, or any of the uh, third and fourth topic uh, before we ask Mark just to review what's coming on topic five. Just uh, if I could just come back in there, Steve, because I wouldn't yeah. want to leave a point of confusion at all. But just, just to further clarify my comment about the thematic uh, approach that was coming through uh, the, those that looked at uh, topic three. Really, what, I, what, what, what colleagues were saying there, where there was, um, there was some, some serious child safeguarding incidents with very similar characteristics in a very similar time scale. Um, that actually, as long as you are looking at the individual circumstances for each of those children, it may well be that you could cover that in one rapid review meeting. And it's the learning that is theme that's coming out of that. So just, just wanted to make sure that uh, colleagues were clear on that. Good. Thank you for that. Um, Steve, can I say something? Yes, Betty. Um, just in relation to the thematic versus the individual rapid review, mm issue. I mean, we've, we've had quite a number of um, rapid reviews in relation to knife crime in Slough, and we're really worried about that. But we're doing both. We're, we're doing, we're just at the point now of doing a retrospective analysis of the case that we've reviewed in the last six months, and there's quite a few, because we're really worried about that. But I do think that when there is an individual case, even though initially it may not look like there's new learning, you still need to do a rapid review of some sort or another, just to make sure that you haven't missed anything and to bring the information together. And then if you do have a sequence of rapid reviews and you identify a theme, then you look retrospectively at that. And I think you, you can actually do both. But I also have a second point, which is around our assumptions around the, the three statutory partners. Uh, while that's in the guidance, I've never really been uh, completely comfortable with it because we have three statutory partners which could lead to the alienation or the, the feeling of not being engaged by the other partners who are around the room, particularly the health providers. And we need to always be mindful, I think, that there is a power 
transparency between the CCGs who are commissioning to provide your services. And that's in the room when you're actually looking through reflective learning and trying to create a non-blaming culture. But I think we need to be aware of that and not put, you know, try and spread that out a little bit. You know, that power discrepancy is quite difficult to handle sometimes. Um, so I think it's really important that we acknowledge that and not over-egg the whole yeah. strategy part. I think it's absolutely right because it's the guidance and, you know, I, that's acceptable. But we need to be absolutely clear that there's learning and, and people need to be empowered to engage together as yeah. opposed to re over-relying on the three staff partners. It's really important, I think, that we don't overdo Thank that. Thank you, Betty. Yeah, excellent point. So um, nicely on to Mark, who's going to review the uh, final topic for us briefly uh, on the potential difficulties to publication uh, to oh, white guiding so I'm going to be really Mark. quick because I know time's pressing and people are having to uh, go. So, and yeah. Some of this we've touched on, of course, already, so I'll be very focused. And Remember that the purpose of the review is to identify the learning for the safeguarding system in your um, area and that the report should be constructed. Whatever methodology you end up using, the report should be constructed in a way that, that best illustrates that. And the issues about lots of lots of detail, um, intimate, personalised detail about family lives, which people then get worried about, re-traumatizing and, and that being made into the public uh, domain are not central to the identification of that that learning so in a way there's a chicken and egg um, uh, answer to this question that think about the what it is you want to review what it is you need to look at and how that is going to be captured prior to the report being finalized and ready for publication um, in advance so you don't get to a place that you kind of buy an unintended consequences that you then got difficulty in uh, publishing. Dale's touched on the work we're doing with the uh, CPS uh, but my experience elsewhere is you can also where there are issues around criminal prosecutions and sometimes around care proceedings you can get into those debates locally with the, with the police and with the courts around separating that which is needed for uh, the work to, to prosecute or to decide everything, and that which is to disseminate uh, learning from the case. And as long as there's a clear line of separation, often the progress can be made. Steve, I'm showing Brilliant. up. Thank you. Th thank you, Mark. And uh, re real appreciation from the panel members just for uh, their, their reactiveness and their responsiveness today uh, to the flood of information that's come at them. Um, I'm going to ask Karen just to close us out in the last two minutes, but whilst we're doing that, your screen um, has an evaluation on it. Um, obviously, your feedback is uh, more than welcome, and uh, there'll be a second uh, feedback just asking about what you liked and what we could do better on this type of uh, engagement on, on this sort of webinar. Um, but if you fill out the survey first, um, then we'll get some stats so that we can also publish those back to you. Uh, in terms of the response we got. Um, so thanks everyone. Karen, close us out. Thank you. Literally a massive thank you to everybody for your engagement. It's been so rich and the questions, um, we, it's going to take us a little while to get through them all, but what we'll do is theme them all and put a response in and then find a mechanism to share all of that together with all the presentations. But I think this is the beginning of something we're all quite enjoying getting involved in. And actually the interaction between the panel and yourselves on the local partnerships is fabulous. And just carry on doing all your good work because let's remember, Lots of good work going on out there all the time. Thank you very much indeed.